Alonzo Brooks. Alonzo Brooks was a friendly 23-year-old Kansas resident who was of African-American and Mexican descent. He worked as a custodian for Countryside Maintenance in Gardner and enjoyed spending time at home with his family, listening to music and watching sports with his mates. On the evening of the 3rd of April 2004, Alonzo and six of his mates jumped in their cars and drove to a party at a farmhouse in a small rural town of Lacey, Kansas, which was approximately 45 miles away. Alonzo didn't have a license, so he rode with his friend Justin. They assumed it was going to be a small gathering, but it soon blew up to having more than 100 guests arrive from nearby towns, whom none of them he knew. He was only one of a couple of black men there. Alonzo was having a good time at the party. However, as it started getting late, his friends began to leave with each one assuming that someone else had given him a ride home. The following morning, when one of his friends called his house, his mother explained that Alonzo never returned from the party, which was unlike him, as he never slept anywhere but in his own bed. Alonzo's family and friends travelled to Lacine, frantically searching for him, but they could only find his boots and hat in the weeds across the road from the long driveway to the farmhouse. Nobody at the farmhouse or in the small township claimed to have seen Alonzo. Rumours spread about possible racial slurs and threats being thrown around at the party after Alonzo's friends left. It was said that he was being flirtatious with a white girl and was dragged or chased down the driveway and his life was taken. Despite the authorities having thoroughly searched the area near the farmhouse multiple times, Alonzo was nowhere to be found. Then, around a month later on the 1st of May, his family organised their own search party and his body was located within half an hour, in the same area as the sheriff had previously searched. Alonzo was discovered fully clothed, lying on top of a debris pile in the creek, just 250 feet from the farmhouse. When they found him, he appeared to only have mild decomposition, which was strange considering he'd only been missing for a month. This led to further rumours that Alonzo's body was kept in a freezer, then placed in the creek for his family to find. The medical examiner indicated that Brooks did not have any broken bones, any signs of blunt force trauma or injury, nor any of the biological signs of drowning in his lungs, thereby being unable to confirm exactly what happened to him, and his cause of loss of life has been deemed inconclusive. The FBI then reopened Alonzo's case around 16 years later, and is now offering a $100,000 reward for any information that may help solve this case. Investigators had interviewed dozens of partygoers at the time, and his family are desperately searching for someone to provide information that can give closure to this case. The US Attorney Stephen McAllister said in June 2020, likely multiple people know what happened that night in April of 2004, it is past time for the truth to come out. The code of silence must be broken. Alonzo's family deserves to know the truth, and it's time for justice to be served. His body was confirmed to have been exhumed on the 21st of July 2020 from his Topeka, Kansas grave after a recent spike in interest in the case. Many are dissatisfied with the initial medical examiner's determination of cause of loss of life, which had been deemed as unacceptable, with many believing foul play was afoot and had been covered up all these years. It is hoped further information will now come to light as part of the ongoing FBI investigation. Laureen Ron. Laureen Ron was a 14-year-old girl that lived with her mom, Judith, on the third floor apartment in Manchester, New Hampshire. She was studious and always aspired to get good grades. She enjoyed singing and dancing and wanted to become an actress. In April 1980, during a spring break from Laureen's school, her mother had a boyfriend who was a professional tennis player. On the 26th of that month, her mother spent the evening attending an out-of-town tennis match with him. Usually, Laureen would tag along, but in this instance, she asked for permission to stay at home and her mother agreed. During this time, Laureen invited a male and female friend over to the apartment and they all drank beer and wine together. At some point during the evening, her male friend heard voices in the apartment's hallway, so he left using the back door, assuming that Laureen's mother was returning home, as he was afraid of getting into trouble. After he exited, he heard Laureen lock the back door behind him. Sometime around 1.15 a.m. that night, Judith arrived home and noticed something strange on all three of the apartment building's floors. Every light bulb had been unscrewed, leaving the hallways immersed in pitch darkness. When she arrived at her apartment's front door, she found it strange that the door wasn't locked. As she entered and before going to bed, she checked in on Laureen's room and thought she saw a figure asleep in the bed, thinking it was her daughter. 
At 3.45 a.m., Judith woke up and realized to her horror that the figure she spotted in her bed was not Loreen. There was a blanket, a pillow on the couch, and her brand new sneakers and clothing in the living room. The back door was left open and she was nowhere to be seen. Her friend claimed that she had last seen her asleep on the couch. Her mother immediately lodged a missing persons report. Police initially treated her as a runaway despite the fact that Loreen left her purse and other personal belongings behind. As the weeks progressed, they reconsidered the runaway theory and stated that it appeared that Loreen stepped out willingly with the intention of going back inside but met with foul play. Several months later, Judith was billed for three California phone calls to her home phone on the 1st of October, 1980. These calls had been made from a hotel out in Santa Monica, California. Two of the calls were made to a motel in Santa Ana and one to a teen assistance hotline. In 1980, calls could be charged to your own number by contacting the telephone company and entering a code. Doing this was more cost effective than placing a collect call. However, Judith had no connections to anyone in California. In 1985, Lorraine's male friend that had drinks on the night she disappeared took his own life. It was believed, however, that he was not a suspect in her disappearance. A private investigator was hired by Judith to visit California in 1986 who located the motels from which the October 1980 phone calls had been placed. Local police in Santa Monica stated that one of the motels may have been used as a filming location by a child predator known as Dr. Z. However, law officials were unable to link Dr. Z to the hotline and no charges were laid. That same year, a childhood sweetheart of Laureen named Roger Murray received a phone call from a woman who claimed to be Laureen. Roger's mother answered the phone call and stated that the woman claimed to have been her son's former girlfriend. The caller, however, was never identified. There have been a couple of unconfirmed sightings of Laureen. A family member claimed to have seen her at a bus terminal in Boston, Massachusetts in 1981 and another in 1988 when a witness claimed to have seen a street worker in Anchorage, Alaska matching her description. About a year after Laureen's disappearance, Judith began receiving regular mysterious phone calls that came in roughly at about 3.45 a.m., which was the same time that Judith initially placed the call to police. For years, these phone calls persisted, especially around the festive season. The caller would ring, but there would be silence on the other end. Years later, the calls ceased after Judith changed her number, relocated to Florida, and remarried. She believes that the first three phone calls made from California were from Loreen, and she also believes that at least one of Loreen's friends knows something but are refusing to say anything. Two other young women also disappeared around the time that Loreen vanished. They were 25-year-old Denise Deneau and 16-year-old Rachel Garden. Although Denise was older than Loreen, they did have similarities in appearance and only lived a couple of blocks from each other. Rachel, on the other hand, was from a nearby town but also closely resembled Laureen. No evidence has been provided to link these cases. On the night of her disappearance, there were no signs of a struggle which seems to indicate that she walked out the door on her own accord. Could it be possible someone was stalking her, monitoring her movements, and chose this opportunity when her mother was out of town to abduct her? The answer may lie with whoever it was at those motels in Santa Monica and Santa Ana that may have the information required to uncover what happened to Laureen. To this day, it remains a mystery and the case remains unsolved. Arthur Jones, 52-year-old Arthur Jones, owned and operated a car dealership and was a fellow Phil, Pennsylvania resident. Neighbors spotted him entering his three-bedroom home on the 17th of September, 1991 at around 7.15 that evening. Just over seven hours later, his house was leveled due to an explosion caused by his propane gas furnace. The explosion blew all four of the walls out and brought the roof down. It hurled debris more than 100 feet away, destroyed a car and left the ruins in flames. Heavy equipment was brought in to remove the debris. However, despite a 20-hour search, no remains were found. His driver's license and his credit cards were located. It was suspected that he may have vanished voluntarily, since he was heavily in debt to his car dealership, or he may have been abducted and met with foul play, since no trace of him was found. The case was solved in April of 1992, when Arthur's remains were found at the bottom of a cliff 400 yards from his house. It was determined that he suffered a skull fracture, which ultimately took his life. Authorities believe that he initially survived the explosion, 
but was dazed and confused as a result. He then wandered away from his home and then fell off the cliff. They didn't believe that his body could have possibly been blown that far from his home, 